Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley, and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Stuart Diamond, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Stuart is here today to discuss his book, Getting More, How to Negotiate to Achieve Your Goals in the Real World. It has just been listed on the New York Times bestseller list, which is great. Um, common techniques like good cop, bad cop, power plays, or even win-win have been the go-to ways to negotiate. Getting More says that emotions and perceptions are more important than power and logic, and focusing on getting more rather than getting everything makes all the difference in effective negotiation. Stuart Diamond is one of the world's leading experts on negotiation. He teaches an award-winning course at Wharton School and has advised many Fortune 500 companies. He is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter for the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming Stuart to Microsoft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about a new model of human interaction one that uh, minimizes uh, events like Tucson and causes people in all walks of life, from kids to career to business, to do better in all their negotiations. And I wanted to demonstrate this with a couple of anecdotes. First, I had a former student who works for Exxon come up to Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago, took a Southwest airline from Houston to Philly, Flight was four hours late. When he landed in Philly, the rest of the passengers were snarling at the flight, flight attendants and complaining to airline personnel. This former student went up to the flight attendants, apologized for everybody else's behavior, and commiserated with them that, you know, it must be a drag to work long days. When he got off the plane, they gave him $600. <laughs> because he made a connection with them. Second anecdote uh, is I had somebody from a very large Silicon Valley uh, company whose name you'll, you'd all know. Um, and uh, he was negotiating in Southeast Asia with a company uh, to get some uh, on a technology deal. And the company could not afford the prices. And so this uh, manager of, uh, of, of networks tried to probe a little more deeply and try to find out, okay, what are your problems? What are you happy about? What are you sad about, et cetera? And he found out that the company was trying to start up a new venture in another field, couldn't get financing, and uh, the new venture would help it with the cash flow to be able to have an alliance with this first company. And so instead of dealing with the deal, this manager went to his senior managers at his, at his company and arranged for his company to loan money to this company in Southeast Asia to finance an entirely different venture in another field completely at standard debt interest rates. And the company, of course, was thrilled with this and had also told this manager that um, they had all this extra fiber optic cable and inventory they really didn't need anymore and so they gave the company from Silicon Valley a 96% discount, and they made $500 million on the deal. The, the two things that were important here are, first of all, these two guys made a human connection with other people. It wasn't about technology or facts. Second, they tried to find out the pictures in the heads of the other party. This is very different from what happens in the world today, as you know. If you look at the Congress, if you look at health care, if you look at the axis of evil, if you look at the debate over abortion, if you look at the parents that beat their kids at the airport, if you look at the feuds over business, labor management, etc., the conflict, the conflict 
model of negotiation is what people use, or at least they don't use the collaborative model of negotiation. They don't try to find out enough about each other. And in fact, finding out the pictures and the heads of the other party is more important than any collection of facts, resources, or evidence that you can muster. And so that means power, leverage, threats, my way or the highway, logic, take it or leave it. They don't work very well. In fact, they work one, they work one quarter as well as collaboration. Those people who are used to getting deals, hard bargainers, tough guys, the usual way they say, look, I got a deal, but they got it in a vacuum. They didn't realize there was another way that was much more profitable. And let me use the theories of John Nash as a good example of that. As you know, John Nash, a Princeton mathematician, won the Nobel Prize uh, based on his theories. Uh, one of them <clears throat> was that he proved the 1755 hypothesis of Swiss philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau hypothesized that when parties collaborate, the overall size of the pie expands to such an extent that each party gets much more than it can get alone. And the example he used was four hunters individually can each only get a rabbit, but together they can get a deer. Compare this to the Democrats forcing the health care bill down the throats of the Republicans, and the Republicans repealing as much of the health care bill as they possibly can. There's not any collaboration going on there, which means that we're getting a worse health care bill than we could otherwise. And in a million different situations around the world, from shopping, from travel, from restaurants, it's the same. And so I wanted to mention some of the tools in getting more, a book I wrote, to try to begin to put out something different out there and it's based on the 30,000 people I've taught in 45 countries uh, over 20 years who found a different way. And some of you, former students of mine, of course, will be able, uh, will know that for yourselves. Let me put out for you before I go on some of the results from people who did this another way. <clears throat> um, I've given presentations at Microsoft. And I've also gotten some feedback from them. But I've had in my class at Wharton three women from India who got out of their own arranged marriages in India using course tools. After the invitations had been sent out, daddy paid for the wedding with somebody from another sect. Four-year-olds brush his teeth, goes to bed. Hollywood writer's strike uh, was solved by this method, which I'll talk about shortly, and all kinds of of situations. I had somebody uh, in my class at Wharton who was dinged by, who was rejected by 18 companies in, uh, in looking for a job. So he took the course and he said, I took the course because I got dinged 18 times. I said, no problem. We'll just go back to the same 18 firms. And he said, Professor Diamond, with respect, you're crazy. And I said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to contact alumni. You're going to contact uh, people who used to work at the firm. You're going to contact HR, and you're going to write 18 different resumes, one for each firm, one for each individual who interviews you, one for each department that interviews you, talking about their hopes and dreams and fears. No one size fits all but the pictures in their head. Well, he gave up after 12 final interviews and a fistful of jobs. He said it's like taking candy from babies. I don't want to do this anymore. So, so the, the differences are substantial, but most of the time the tools are invisible. And what I try to do is put this into a structure that you can use this over and over again. Why this is so important, because negotiation is the basic process of human interaction. You can't get away from it. You can only do it well or badly, which means driving down the street, uh, talking casually to your friends, there's negotiation going on. There's no difference between negotiation, persuasion, communication, sales. It's all the same. You can't avoid it. You can do it well or badly. Saying you avoid negotiations means 
You can sit on the sidelines and they score touchdowns all day long. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give yourself over to negotiation actively every hour, but it does mean that the more conscious you are of what goes on around you, the better interventions you can make. There's an old maxim about the difference between expert and non-expert knowledge. A, a non-expert looks at the field and sees flat land. An expert looks at the same field and begins to see little peaks and valleys, little bits of relief. It takes no more time or energy for the expert to collect a greater amount of information from that landscape than the non-expert, but the expert can make much better use of that information to pursue opportunities and minimize risks. And so we're talking about understanding the topography of your life a lot more clearly and then taking better actions because of it. The distance between success and failure is very, very small. So small <clears throat> as to be invisible. And so it's a word, a turn of phrase. It's not a home run. It's, hi, what's going on? Trying to form a connection. I like to use a baseball analogy. If you're a 280 hitter in baseball and you get one extra hit every nine games, one extra hit every 36 at bats, you become a 310 hitter in baseball, which is worth two things. One, a place in the Hall of Fame and two, $10 million more a year. And so what I'm trying to do is just get one extra hit every nine games. It's a small difference. But as I said, the tools are invisible and can benefit anybody. This is, um, this is a quote from Stephanie Camp, who until very recently worked here. She's a former a student of mine. And this is a quote from somebody uh, at, uh, at Google. And so you'll find that people, this is becoming a bit of an open secret in some of the most successful companies of the world but you will find that it can be used immediately in your own life. So let me take a few of these principles and, and show you a little more closely uh, how they work. There are four stages of negotiation operationally. The first stage is force, power, my way or the highway, take it or leave it. It is not that it doesn't work. We can force people to do things. It's just that it's expensive, it's not self-reinforcing, and it generally causes resentment and retaliation. Whether that is malicious obedience at work, my kid is kicking and screaming on the floor, or terrorism. It's just not a real good way to do things, but it can be done in limited situations. But that is the tool of choice by most people in the world. Do you think by telling Iran or Cuba or North Korea we're going to have sanctions, that are going to say, okay, we give up? It's what I call the Alamo strategy. They will fight to the last man standing. That's what it is. And it's not effective, and yet people do it. So let's look at something a little bit better. <clears throat> oh, by the way, and these are the things that characterize number one. The people on the left get four times as much as the people on the right. They get twice as many deals, and each deal they get is worth twice as much. And unless you see this, you don't even know that you got less. And in a highly competitive world, that's a big deal. Okay, so, and, and by the way, power is also pretty unstable. You use power a lot. Soon you become the issue and other people can get more power than you. This Palestinian boy is not getting run over by this Israeli tank. And so an example of how things can change. Okay, next one down. To get people to think what you want to think. That's better. So-called interest-based negotiation, win-win, etc., and that's been negotiation for the last 30 years. And that, of course, again, is better. Parties see some rational benefit in what you're suggesting to them. That is not nearly what's required, although it's better. 
The world is an irrational place. And the more important the negotiation is to the parties, the more irrational they are. And that means world peace, a billion dollar deal, or my kid wants an ice cream cone. When people are irrational, they don't care about interest-based negotiation. They don't care about win-win. If I am feeling hurt financially by an increase in taxes, I don't want to know about win-win. I want to know, how are you going to make my family better? How are you going to make me whole? Uh, what about uh, you know, my, my vacation? Uh, are you going to apologize to me? Am I going to get some empathy? Will I get a concession? And so when people are emotional, they don't think clearly and they get distracted. A, a good example, uh, there's been a lot recently about um, internet buying and how it's hurting brick and mortar stores. And the advice in the Wall Street Journal is you go with your cell phone and when they tell you the price of a TV or refrigerator, you go online and you, you see it's cheaper and then you either go somewhere else or threaten to go somewhere else. Threatening somebody to go somewhere else basically wants them to, want, they want to do this to you, right? They don't want, you make them angry, their job is at stake. That's not the right way to do it. What you need is an emotional payment to them. You need to say, you know, it must be really hard for you working in an environment like this. I bet you work on commission. I bet people keep leaving this. Why don't we leave you? Why don't we do this? What other kinds of discounts do you give people here to make them whole? Do you have employee discounts? Can I get a volume discount? In an appliance store, buying two TVs is a volume discount because it's different from what they usually sell. Are there warranties? Are there service contracts? Is there a collection of goods and services I could buy over the next year that will actually be better than uh, just buying on the Internet? But I want to give them my problem, and I want to work on it with them together. I've started by giving an emotional payment, and then maybe you can talk about mutual benefits, but I don't like the term win-win anyway. I might want to lose today to get more tomorrow, and besides winning, it means losing. You know, and it's just a, it feels vaguely manipulative. What I want to know is, have our goals been met? Did we benefit from this in some way? It also doesn't tell me what to do. What, what I want to think about is, let's meet each other's needs, things we value unequally. So maybe, for example, I'll give you referrals if you lower the price. That tells me what to do. Win-win just tells me some kind of buzzword. Doesn't do good for me. Get rid of the buzzword. A mentor of mine once said, gravity, you know, what does gravity mean? You know, once you learn the word, learning stops. So I want to think about what does it mean? And so that's number two, and that people stop there and they think they've done their job. This is not nearly what is required. What's required are steps three and four which I referred to earlier, which is to find out what they perceive and find out what they feel. Totally self-enforcing and free. Almost nobody goes there. And I want to give you another example. In February of 2008, not quite three years ago, I got a call on a Tuesday from Ari Emanuel, who's the most prominent agent in Hollywood and is the role model for the agent on Entourage, uh, the brother of Ram, who was the White House chief of staff. And they wanted some help on the writer's strike, which, as you know, nobody was getting any new TV material, which had been going on for a year. <clears throat> so I talked to the Writers Guild chief negotiator and told him to stop worrying about the facts, the substantive issues, to go see the studio heads and their representatives that Thursday morning for a scheduled breakfast and ask them three questions. Question number one, are you guys happy? We're not happy. Question number two, are you guys making any money? We're not making any money. Question number three, if you had to do this over again, how would you do it? It took 30 minutes to restart the negotiations after a three-month strike, and it took two days to get an agreement after a year in controversy. There's two things I can say about this. One, it's not rocket science, and two, it's completely invisible unless you already know how to do it. And so, again, a different way. They're very subtle, but they're different ways of thinking about the situation. 
Um, now what I want to do is put up the major model that supports this, which will come as a surprise to a lot of technologically oriented people at Microsoft, it always does. You think the negotiation is about this. You know, I'm an expert in software. I'm an expert in hardware. I'm a financier. I'm a lawyer in this subject. False. Less than 10% of the reason why people reach agreements has anything whatsoever to do with the fact. Fully more than 50% has to do with whether the people like and trust each other, and another almost 40% has to do with the process they use. Do they interrupt each other? Do they have an agenda? Do they see commitments, etc.? And if you think that this is the negotiation, sadly, you're going to be right more than you're persuasive. The truth is only one argument, and the facts are only one argument. This is very hard for people who are substantively based to accept, but it's absolutely true based upon a ton of research. Question, how come O.J. Simpson was found not guilty by the first jury in Los Angeles despite a yard of DNA evidence, including his blood at the site? Because the jury didn't like or trust the prosecutor. And if they don't like you and they don't trust you, they won't hear you. Just because you're yakking at them and they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Doesn't mean they hear a word you say. Just because they're writing furiously, they may be writing down, I hate this person. <laughs> and so the first thing I've got to do is get people ready to listen to me. And when people are angry, upset, uncertain, they physiologically hear less. The last time I was at Microsoft... I looked up Microsoft on one of the search engines, and I actually typed in the words, Europe hates Microsoft. And I asked the group why I got 5 million hits in a tenth of a second. And I said, that costs you money. So I want to know, your technology is fantastic, and that can sustain. I tell this to all the big companies. I don't just single you out, but you know, they got to like you. George Bush was elected in 2000 because they liked him more than the other guy who had much more experience and much more expertise. Barack Obama was elected in 2008 because it looked like McCain was going to slug him about 20 times during the second presidential debate. <laughs> so if people can run for president on this, you want to think about it hard. The characteristics and sensibilities of the people in the negotiations so dominate every other part of the negotiation is not even worth talking about race, religion, gender, culture, creed unless you know who's sitting across from you. If you bring three people to a negotiation on Monday and so do they and you bring a fourth person on Tuesday it's a completely different negotiation. Even with the same six people somebody's kid might be sick somebody may have had a bad commute so the first thing I want to do is I want to take the emotional temperature of the person sitting across from them, even if, and especially if I'm married to them. I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of emotional payments. I told my class at Wharton that sometimes I tell my wife she's right, even if I don't think she is, to preserve marital harmony. And so I thought to myself after that, well, that's not fair. I told the class something I didn't tell my wife. So I went home and I said to my wife, dear, you know, I told the class today that sometimes I tell you that you're right, even if you're not, to preserve marital harmony. And you know what she said? That'll work. <laughs> and so the, 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 the notion, the notion of, of giving the other party an emotion, which means that if you go negotiate with a small company, people in that company probably think you're an elephant. And you probably want to say to them, if that's what you're feeling, do you guys think we're going to Bigfoot this? You know, you're, you're in their brain then. You're, you're dealing with them as a person. You guess if you don't know. You guess right, they'll be happy. You guess wrong, they'll tell you that you're wrong, but you'll make that connection. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I want to think about. Um, I'm not sure I, I, I had somebody from a, 
from a technology company, I don't think I mentioned this to you, trying to get a multi-million dollar account. Couldn't get the account. So uh, he found out about, uh, about the guy, asked lots of questions, found out the guy's daughter was having computer problems. So he said, why don't I come over on a Saturday, tutor your daughter, and fix the computer? He invested half a day. He did that. He got the account. Because... Because different from interest-based negotiation is the synapses of all of the parties are grist for your negotiation, not just the four corners of the deal. The CEO of a major company in Philadelphia once told me that the most important thing he ever did for his biggest client in a 20-year relationship, business relationship, was to pick up the client CEO's mother-in-law at the Philadelphia airport one Saturday night has nothing to do with any deal, but it affects every deal. And so you will never sell a commodity product, service, or price-based product or service alone as long as your synapses and their synapses are in the deal. Because then every deal is different. There is no one-size-fits-all. I've had the occasion to look at all 2,200 Tons of negotiating books written since 1950s, and I found some doozies. How about How to Negotiate with the Japanese? I love that title. <laughs> What's wrong with that title? What? You're going to negotiate with 130 million Japanese? How interesting. You're going to negotiate with a person or two people who may or may not be the same as the cultural norm. I once had some problem with some clients. I said, what's the problem? They said, we hate lawyers. I'm a lawyer. I said, okay, why? And they mentioned some problem they had in Cincinnati with some lawyers. I said, I've got a really good news for you. I don't know them. I'm not related to them. I'm not responsible for them. Why are you responsible for everything Microsoft might have done or not since it was founded? That's not fair. Are they responsible for everything their company did? And they might say, well, company culture. And I might say, well, maybe... But aren't two better questions, can I meet your needs, and can I make a commitment that sticks? So I want to keep this focus on the parties at the table, and I want to keep asking them questions. So the right answer to the statement, I hate you, is tell me more. (laughs) Or what do you hate most about us, and what do you like most about our competitors? It's an irresistible question, and it gets me into the pictures in their heads. And so this is the most important thing I have to say. And some of you will say, I know that. It's irrelevant if you know it. You have to do it. I've taught 650 CEOs, and they say things to me like, we learned this in business school. And I say, then why don't you do it? (laughs) You actually have to do it. It doesn't matter if you know it. Okay, so we mentioned this. Uh, Once you figure out the pictures in their heads, you have to understand what they perceive. And this is another really big deal in negotiation. I put this up in my classes. I point to the red dot, and I say, write down in two words what you see, and I get this, and hundreds more. In fact, less than half of the answers have the word red in it. So, what does that show? First of all, people process a small amount of the available information, which is much more white space. And number two, they're dramatically different ideas of what you saw. And so, from all the experiences you have, you will get very significant differences in perceptions. You come home from work, you say to your significant other, significant other, what time is dinner tonight? And your significant other says, what, you think I'm late? And you're thinking, I just want to know if I have to exercise. Time to exercise. In many ways, large and small, who is the axis of evil? Is abortion killing? You know, you need to understand and address the differing perceptions or else you'll never get anywhere in a negotiation. You've all seen this picture. There are two women in this picture, a young woman right there. Uh, There's her necklace. There's her chin. 
There's her ear, eyelash, and nose. An old woman, all this. Here's her chin. Here's her mouth. Uh, here's her nose. And here's her eye. We've given the young woman half, this, this part, to a class uh, to tell them to look at it for five minutes. Then the old woman, all this, minus these two, to look at for five minutes. And during that time, we took the combined picture off the screen, and then we put the combined picture back on the screen. What do you think happened? Well, as you might expect, almost nobody can see the other one. So the question is, if people have trouble seeing an image they know is there after seeing a contrary image for five minutes, how much trouble do you think that one culture has seeing another culture's point of view that has seen the same picture for a thousand years? And that doesn't just mean cultures, it means the marketing department and the production department, the legal department and the sales department. This is a much more serious problem than you think. It's not that they're being stubborn or obnoxious. The thing you see so clearly is not there for them at all. It never existed. And so you've got to start at the beginning. We do, in the courses I teach, we do a row reversal. And in one of the large companies, I made one of the attorneys from the legal department play a role of the salesperson. And in a case they had internally, they had some problems between sales and legal. And he said, it was amazing to me, after five minutes, how much I hated lawyers. <laughs> and so just by simply trying, and what they did as a result of that is go and join sales calls, legal department, sales department. And so there are fixes for this, but you need to do things uh, step by step. There's a couple, I'll open this up to questions. There's a couple more things that I want to mention to you from this book uh, that, are, that are different than you might think, <clears throat> but which are very relevant to this group. And for, in fact, for what you stand for. The first is, there's been a lot of controversy in this country recently about people who are different. And that, in my view, is frankly stupid. Uh, first of all, the reason there are many studies that show that differences are profitable is the basis for the technology industry. In fact, studies show that work groups that have conflicting perceptions produce three times as many marketable ideas than consensus groups. Even farther, a recent study shows that for each 10% diversity as added to an area, net income increases by 15%. That is huge, and it is why Silicon Valley is located outside of San Francisco, and it is why your very presence here makes Seattle more profitable, because diversity means new ideas. So if somebody says to me with some frustration, we're different from each other, I'm going to say, that's great, we're going to make money. Homogeneity, not profitable. We need some people around here who disagree with us so we can make some money around here. I want to turn the paradigm on its head because the studies show that it's more profitable to have disagreement. I want to know what's in your head so we can make more value out of it. I talked about valuing things differently. The guy with the computer time over the house with the daughter is an example. Um, another technology firm, a vendor wanted to raise the price, a firm about the size of Microsoft. Uh, and, uh, and he couldn't pay a higher price. So he thought about the vendor and said to the vendor, I know how hard it is for you to get into a technology firm like us. I'll tell you what I'll do. You keep the price the same, and I'll provide you an introduction to other departments. You take it from there, but you get the introduction. Just for the introduction alone, the vendor was willing to keep the price the same, which was worth a few million dollars. That's items of unequal value. And you can use this all over the place. For example, at home, my wife, she loves to garden. And she especially loves to garden with me. Me, I hate to garden. And I especially hate to garden with my wife, who's entirely too bossy. But I will garden with my wife almost any time she asks in return for three uninterrupted hours in front of the television set any time during the year a professional football game happens to be on. I'm open for trade. <laughs> and so I'm looking around 
for things to trade. I would be remiss, this is my eight-year-old son Alexander, if I didn't talk for a moment about kids. Kids are easy to negotiate with if you understand some things about them. The first thing is, kids have no power, they want power. So I'm forever saying to Alexander, who's eight, Alexander, why don't you pick the restaurant we go to tonight? It's okay if your room is a little bit messy. Yeah, you can stay up another five or ten minutes later. And you know what? Alexander is always in a debtor position with me. He always owes me stuff. Because I'm always proactively giving him stuff. And so then when I want something from him, he is more likely to do it. I also tend to respect the kid. So the kid's watching TV again when I come home from work. I don't shut off the TV. I think, hmm... I come home from work, I'm stressed out, I have a drink. Maybe the kid's stressed out, right? Elementary school can be stressful. So I say to the kid, did you have a hard day? Are you trying to chill out? How long did you think you wanted to watch TV? The kid remembers that. You also want to think about the fact that kids are really incremental, right? Can I have a cookie? When I have a half a cookie, well, can I have a quarter of a cookie? You want to speak their language. A couple of weeks ago, Alexander wouldn't do his homework. 7.30 at night is math homework. My wife says, do your homework. Alexander says, how about 8.30? My wife goes ballistic. I said, how about 7.33? He said, okay. <laughs> My wife said, what is this? And I said, I spoke his language. I said, I'm incremental too. He gave me a 57-minute concession. <laughs> okay, so you want to see how the kids, you want to think like children. This I mentioned. I want to just mention one or two things about communication. Don't walk out on negotiations. Don't do what they do in law and order and elsewhere. The signal is, I don't even value you enough to give you the time of day. And so the alternatives are war, litigation, or no deal. Stay in there pitching and hear what they have to say. Only take a break if it's mutually agreed upon. That is really key in negotiations. Uh, walking out to stock and trade, it doesn't work uh, very well. One more uh, item I want to mention to you before I tell you a, a closing story. And this is uh, hard to, ex hardest to explain, one, but it was one of my favorites. And I want to just give you a couple of examples. Find their policies. Find what causes them to give you things and what they promised the public. Did they promise a high service if they're a cable TV or a telephone company? So if they give you lousy service, you'll call up and you'll say, I read on your website that customers are the most important part of your business. How does that compare to this situation? I was just curious. <laughs> um, I had a student went to McDonald's 5 to 11 one night, French fries are soggy. The clerk wouldn't make new French fries. Went to the corner of the counter, got McDonald's freshness guarantee, showed it to the clerk, got fresh french fries. No muss, no fuss. Had a student rented a car in Albuquerque from Avis. Uh, 100 miles out of the lot, the student realized that, uh, that he paid for a car one class higher than he got, didn't feel like going back. Went back at the end of a week and asked for a credit, was told he couldn't get a credit. Because the customer rep said, it says in the contract that you sign that you pay for the car you signed for when you leave the lot. Turn over the contract, there was a contract and his signature. So he looks at this contract and he says to the sales rep, not my responsibility to read this contract. The sales rep says, why not? The student says, did you ever look at this contract? You can't even read this contract. And as you know, rental car contracts are eight-point light gray type on light pink paper. He said to the sales rep, why, if it was my responsibility to read this contract, your slogan wouldn't be, we try harder, it would be, you try harder. <laughs> <laughs> Have they ever made exceptions to policies? Have you ever made an exception to charging $200 to change your flight fee? Have you ever made an exception to a one o'clock checkout. That should be hardwired to your brain. Every time somebody tells you with their policy, ask them if they ever made an exception. On uh, one more example, I had a woman who was, uh, got, uh, got a job offer from McKinsey. She thought she deserved a $30,000 extra bonus. She had a lot of experience in media entertainment division, which is what she was going into. Her boss-to-be thought she was right, 
wouldn't give her uh, a, um, a, a, a bonus because one firm, that's how, that's how it is at McKinsey. So she said, thinking of her goals, when's the first time McKinsey can give a bonus to a new hire? And her boss-to-be said three months. And she said, why don't you just pay me the 30000 in three months? He said, sure. <laughs> that negotiation took less time than it took for me to tell it to you. Find out their standards. Never make yourself the issue, though. The more difficult they become, the calmer you have to become, especially with hard bargainers. That's what Gandhi and Martin Luther King did. Whatever these tools are, none work all the time, and some don't work half the time, but they work more than if you don't use them. Don't worry about hard cases. Start small, start incrementally, and build up from there. And here is my course in three sentences. What I want at the end of the process I don't have now. Who are they and what will it take to persuade them? Uh, I want to end on a, this note about being incremental again because it's really important. We would have had a health care plan 15 years ago if they had started with one replicatable one scalable health clinic instead of trying to do everything at once. That's what the technology industry does. They haven't learned that in the Middle East either. They should have started with one factory. If the other party is saying no, wonder aloud if you're making too big a jump. Shorten the question, make the project more modest, ask for a little less. If the kid won't clean his room, will he clean a quarter of his room? If Somebody won't go on a major trip, go on a minor trip. If they won't accept a big project with a client, try an experiment, and you'll find that it's much uh, more powerful. Um, I want to end with a little anecdote involving a child to give you a sense with the things I've been talking about, just how far you can go in a short period of time. I had a woman in my class whose five-year-old daughter fell in the kitchen one Saturday morning and gashed her forehead on the sharp corner of the kitchen table. The child was hysterical. The child's grandfather, the father of the student, was hysterical. The student, the mother of this girl, was about to become hysterical when she stopped herself and said to herself, wait a minute now, I'm taking a negotiation course. I'm going to negotiate this. And the issue was the child would not go to the hospital to get stitches. Uh, she was, and she eventually needed 12. She was clinging onto the table for dear life and nobody could pry her little fingers off the kitchen table. So her mother walked over to her daughter and said to her daughter, does mommy love you? Her daughter said yes. Her mother said, would mommy do anything to hurt you? Her daughter said no. Her mother said, when we get to be big people, do we have to do things sometimes we don't like to do? Her daughter said yes. Her mother said, mommy has stitches, showed her scar. Granddaddy has stitches, showed his scar, and within five minutes, her daughter picked herself up and walked to the car by herself. And so think about this in the context of what I've talked about. The mother thinks about the pictures in the daughter's head. The daughter's feeling alone and in pain. The mother says, does mommy love you? Goes right into the daughter's brain as an emotional pain. The daughter then says, okay, I'm not alone, but I'm still in pain. The mother then says, would I do anything to hurt you? And so step by step, the mother brings the daughter to where she wants the daughter to go in a very short period of time and a lot healthier than eventually yanking the daughter and dragging her, kicking and screaming to the car. People always ask me whether these tools are replicatable. And so in a few instances in the book, uh, I show repeated examples of the same thing, and this is one of them. Uh, about a year ago, I got a call from an investment counselor on Long Island named Craig Silverman, who had taken the course uh, and said, I just wanted to tell you something I thought you might be interested in. Um, this morning, I went to a laboratory for a blood test. And I was just about to get the, a routine blood test when there came this blood-curdling scream from the next room from this little girl, and my nurse got, got up, ran over, and I'm just sort of hanging there, not on a blood test, and she disappears. Few minutes go by, screaming continues, and finally I say, Well, what the heck? So I get up and I walk to the next room, and there I see this little girl, 
five or six years old, poor little girl, her mother is pinning her arms back, another nurse is holding her arm down, and the third, nurse, third person is trying to jam this needle into her arm. <laughs> and so Craig walks over to the mother and says, can I talk to your daughter for a minute? Mother says, yes. And Craig walks up in front of the girl and says, look at me for a minute. The girl looks up momentarily. And Craig says, do you think your mommy loves you? The girl says, yes. Craig says, do you think your mommy would do anything to hurt you? The girl says, no. He said, within two minutes, the girl calmed down and was ready for the needle. Craig says, these people looked at me like I was a magician. <laughs> they said, where did you learn that? And to his credit, he told him to buy my book. Thank you very much. <laughs>I'm happy to answer questions uh, from anyone. Yes? How does this technique relate to the perception of favoritism and nepotism? Okay, I'll uh, buy who, uh, with who? Just, I can see it particularly in the corporate areas and even political areas, this being seen as, I mean, I basically agree with your approach, but it's being seen as, well, we're trading favors, which is exactly what it is. Okay, well, all, that's sure. A, bad thing. a couple of responses. All of life is about quid pro quo. The way in which you do the trading is important. Um, there's ethics and lack of ethics. These tools are morally neutral. One of the things I try to do is I try to say, how will this look if it's on the 6 o'clock news? Clearly, the computer guy who helps the other guy's daughter, everybody would think that's cool. And so I want to see how it would look. And it's really only limited. The CEO picks somebody up at the airport. Well, that's, you know, that's really okay. It's not a big investment. Uh, I find out your intangibles. I find out that you like Curacao. I dig out some research and give it to you. I don't give you any money. I just do something for you. And so, so it's really limited by my creativity. It's not something that I um, will do in an unethical way. If I find there's nepotism itself, which I thought you were first asking in a company, I want to know what the standards are. I want to know how do you decide how to promote people? Is this something you keep to? Is it something you value? How does that dovetail with my situation? Those are the ways I want to ask the second part of that. Other questions? Yes? Um, so one of the things, I mean, everything you're saying makes sense, but one concern is how... I guess, do you run into situations where either people are not communicative and then also are you making an assumption about how honest or transparent they'll be? Because you asked about whether people are non-communicative, honest, or transparent. They are, are they honest and transparent? The first thing is, great negotiators have a firm grasp of the obvious, and they say it. So if you're non-communicative, I'm going to say, we don't seem to be communicating. Is that what you feel? Um, did we think we were going to reach a deal? How do I meet your needs if I don't know what they are? I can guess, I suppose, but why are you here? It's really hard to resist that question. Yes, are you going to get to some people where you can't, you can't reach them? But I'm going to get a lot more than if I don't do that. If you're not sure about the other people's honesty, then you have to be much more incremental. You have to give a little bit and see if you get something back. And if you don't, you have to say, I didn't get something back. Another point of honesty is the extent to which people will keep their commitments. And that's a very important part of negotiation, something I also mentioned in the book. People make commitments in all sorts of different ways. A Swiss company got burned by an Arab country because the Swiss company got a signed contract and the Arab country told them, we only make uh, agreements by handshakes. Signatures mean nothing to us. And so you've got to find out how they make commitments. The U.S. got a treaty signed with North Korea. The U.S. then says, North Korea broke the treaty. In the Koreas, treaties are letters of intent. They're not binding. They get bi to be binding through the relationship with the parties afterwards. After the U.S. signed the treaty, the U.S. called Korea, North Korea the actors of evil, wouldn't meet with them, threatened them. There was no binding agreement. So the U.S. Foreign State Department's stupidity was the reason there was no commitment, not anything North Korea did. They were just doing what they did culturally. So I need to know how the, what the other party thinks 
honesty means and proceed from there. Yes. So uh, all that you say makes sense only when yourself is prepared to think that way. And it's, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, when I go into a negotiation table, I might be already mad or I might be already emotionally offset. Yeah, are you, do you have any tips for setting myself back? Yeah. To yeah. The question is, what do you do if the other party doesn't play ball? Actually, I must say that the danger is it's like sharks and people. You know, people are much more dangerous to sharks than sharks are to people. Sharks kill 50 people. People kill 100 million sharks every year. And so it's only the perception that that's what the issue is. The issue is, if they're unprepared, you can destroy them. You can, you can get them to do things against their interests by pushing their hot buttons. Uh, you can set standards they can't come back with. You can use third parties to make them feel bad. What I want to do is make sure, if you're not prepared, that I treat you fairly. If you're a hard bargainer, I want to say, well, don't you want to reach an agreement? Don't you want to get more? I was once uh, dealing with somebody, and they demanded $100,000 from me for this item we were selling. And I said, why don't you want 200000 They said, what? I said, we haven't talked about referrals, cross-selling. What's in the deal? I don't know what's in the deal yet. And so if my ability to conceptualize the deal, to see the future, makes me a lot more powerful. And if you're going to be tough with me, I just want to give you an emotional payment, commiserate with you, and ask you, did you want to make a deal or not? Now, with Iran, the typical hard bargainer, the U.S. is doing it wrong. We're, we're threatening them, which doesn't get them anywhere, and which causes a little distaste with third parties like, like, like uh, Korea, I'm sorry, like Brazil, Venezuela, Turkey, etc. What the U.S. should be doing is making the Iranians seem unreasonable if they're hard bargainers by using standards. Every time Iran opens its mouth, the U.S. should say, so when do we talk? Well, you're the axis of it. You're the devil. Wonderful. When do we talk? Well, we're going to blow up Israel. Outstanding. When do we talk? There's no Holocaust. Excellent. When do we talk? They can't withstand that. You have to have that 150 days in a row. Iran loses Brazil, Venezuela, and Turkey. And so that's my power as a negotiator. So there are ways to be tough that are non-traditional, that are fairly strong. Yes? Question about um, empathizing and empathy. I heard a lot of you talk about that, but it sounds like you think that the, the real value of it comes from person-to-person -person empathy. Um, I know at Microsoft and a lot of other places we do research and we do background and we read people's writings and stuff. Are you saying that to have real validity, empathy has to be a direct one-to-one? -one? No, it has, to, it has to strike a chord in the other side. However you do it, it depends upon who they are. One of the interesting things is people often ask me, who's the best negotiator? And the answer is, the person on your team most likely to get the other side to meet your goals. And it turns out that the more expertise and power people have in co companies, usually the worst negotiators they are, because the less they focus on people. The junior people are usually better negotiators because they make a human connection. And so you want to think about what will it take for the other party to meet my goals. And it's different for every person. Some people might want to see an art exhibit. Somebody else wants FaceTime. It's different for every person. Uh, yes? Um, do you have any suggestions for how to employ some of these techniques in a situation where the other party has more influence over the format of the encounter? Like, for example, in a job interview, the interviewer asks the first question, and it might be whatever they want. So what could the candidate do to kind of start building the emotional Oh, I want to deal with what they want to know. Um, and I want to deal with them directly. Do you have any other offers? Um, uh, I haven't tried to seek any other offers. But I work for a great company, or I, I went to a great school. I could get a fistful of offers if I needed them. You need them to negotiate on my behalf with your bosses. What were, what were you at, about with the question? Is this something the company values, me having other offers, or did you just want to try to reach some agreement today? In other words, you're saying use your response to change the direction. Exactly. I, I, mean, I want to know why they're asking me. I mean, some companies want to know if you have other offers, so they can figure out what to pay you. 
other companies need it to be internal. And so I want to know if I have to go out and get another offer. I can get five offers. The risk is I'll like one of them better than yours and I won't come back. <laughs> so why do I want to do that? Why don't we just do this right here? I want to keep the people focused on what's going on right here. In the back. Professor, you, uh, you gave some really great examples of uh, once you are on, on the table doing some negotiations and you alluded to some uh, complex political issues, for example, in the Middle East. So do you have any suggestions on uh, once there is a sensitive matter and one of the parties maybe doesn't want to come to the table to discuss or has imposed some... Sure. If, the part, if one of the parties is too sensitive to come to the table, clearly you have to be more incremental and get somebody they trust to come to the table. The second thing you can do is you can make it a lot shorter in other ways. People say to me, I'm not negotiating with you, and I say, fine, let's just shoot the breeze. Once they open their mouth, they're negotiating with me. They don't see it that way. What they needed to do in the Middle East for two years is lunch. If they would have spent two years having lunch and never talked about the Middle East, they'd be much farther than they'd be, they are now. And so I want to start off a little more incrementally with what they're comfortable with and start from there. Maybe it's a third party. Maybe it's talking about another subject. Maybe it's doing some other activity. Yes? What is the difference between negotiation and a compromise? Because when you think from the other side of the table, it is a compromise for him. He may think right. for coming to the negotiation. Sure. Table. A compromise is a, for, is a negotiation tactic. It's a form of negotiation. I don't like it because it generally means splitting it down the middle in some way, and I'd rather use standards. You know, if someone says, let's compromise, I want to know why. You can have more than I do if I meet my goals. You can have 10 times as much as I do if I meet my goals. So why do I want to just compromise? Compromising it out means after you've negotiated and you've got everything settled, you have at least teeny little bit left, and then you might compromise that. But I tend to look instead how I meet people's needs. Yes? Uh, a lot of your examples talked about reaching, really reaching that first agreement or one-time negotiations. For ongoing relationships, you talk about incrementalism. Like, what techniques do you have to sort of combat escalating incrementalism? You know, basically, people coming to Set, expect a different standard, moving that standard Sure. Upwards. The first time it happens, I want to say, I detect some escalating incrementalism here. <laughs> I want to say what's going on. Last time you said X, now you say X plus Y. That resets everything. Did you intend to do that? What's changed? Can I escalate incrementally too? <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to say what's going on. People do not expect you to agree with them. They do expect you to be straight with them. Whatever you think about George Bush, I think George Bush won the 2004 election because he said, you might not agree with where I stand, but at least you know where I stand. And so that's really, a, your credibility is the most important thing you have. Yes? You mentioned at the end, you're not... I'm sorry, you're next. Oh, yes. You mentioned at the end you're not going to win them all. What's the signs that when you say we're not going to come to an agreement, how do you back out of that? Christmas? Sure. When they get in the taxi and you're chasing them down the street with your briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to go pretty far. I tend to try. I tend to ask them whether <clears throat> if there's anything else we can do. So, so I guess that's a high-class problem because you won't get there very often. But when they absolutely walk away and won't come back and you're out of ideas, then you go to a third party. And when they're out of ideas, then maybe you're out of ideas. But it's much farther than most people think. Yes? Professor, you've uh, used um, a couple of illustrations centering around children. Let's scale that up and talk about our managers here at Microsoft. The same. <laughs> the same. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Uh, um, at Microsoft, we've got a fairly unusual uh, evaluation HR system. How do we negotiate? Uh, how do we how do we work when we basically have very little um, to, to put on the table? Well, I want to know first of all how I'm evaluated. Next, I want to know what's the menu of things I can get that Microsoft's given in the past. And who has the authority to give that? 
Uh, maybe there are low interest loans. Maybe there is an extra vacation day here and there. Maybe there is a moving expense. Maybe there's a use of equipment. Maybe there's an educational uh, 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 a course. I'll bet that if you did a little project, you would find dozens of things that Microsoft has given out over the years to individuals. That is your resource to negotiate over. And if there's something that's not on the list, my point is, well, not, nothing was on the list originally. What's the case for putting this on the list? Is this consistent with the kind of standards that Microsoft sets for itself? Next thing I want to do is I want to know whether any competitors that Microsoft considers relevant do this for their employees. And so I have a whole bunch of things. And then after I've done all that, I'll say to the manager or the employee, do we have any other ideas? We've got to be smart enough to solve this problem. At Microsoft, there aren't any problems without solutions. Nice little thing to say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes? I have two questions. Um, first, you talked about Iran and how one of the things we should do is sit down and just, you know, talk, have lunch with them. But I remember in the elections, um, you know, between uh, when we had the debates with Hillary and Obama, Obama had said that uh, you know, he would try to talk to them, and, and Hillary had said, no, we're not going to talk to them. And he was the one who was accused of being naive. Same thing when he like, shook uh, Hugo Chavez's hand. So why, is this, why is, does that perception exist? And my second question is, uh, when someone is trying these tactics on me, the, the one that I get most frustrated is when someone does something nice, to, nice for me, where I feel like I have to you know, give back. Quick example, I was pregnant last year and I was negotiating sales targets with our salespeople and they got me a baby shower gift right in the middle of our negotiation and I was like, darn, now I can't. <laughs> you know, um, Let me deal with the second one first. People are very sensitive to your being, manip for being manipulated and you have to make sure you're not, being, not manipulating them because they will sense it. Second of all, if you're feeling uncomfortable about this, you can say something. It depends on your state of the relationship, but when I was a journalist, people would take me out for lunch or, or fancy places, and before we couldn't accept them at all, I used to say, you know, I'm much more expensive than the lunch. Just wanted you to know that. So I'm not, you know, I, I've got to do my job, whatever that happens to be. I really appreciate the baby shower. I have actually gone to, to, to lengths with people I knew were like that, I used to carry books down in my pocket, like chicken soup with rice, other books for the kids. And every time somebody gave me something, I pulled out a book and I gave it to them. Okay, I'm taking the issue away. That comes from preparation. And so I also want to say I'm a little uncomfortable given these negotiations, what's happened, if they surprised you. But, you know, I, I consider you a friend. Um, and I might want to say, notwithstanding this fantastic baby shower, here are some things I think, okay? And then you'll see what they're made of. And then you'll see whether they've done it because they believe it or they did it because they're dishonest. And if they're dishonest, they're really, really everything is fair game. Well, I think they were doing it out of, you know, genuine... Okay, well then, well then maybe you're not the right negotiator at that point and you need to bring somebody else in to help you if that's the case so you don't feel compromised. That might be something else to do. The first question is a little more complicated. I believe Obama lost his nerve because the ratings went down. I believe his first, his speech in Cairo, brilliant speeches to reduce the negativity against the United States. And so I think he's made a real mistake. I think he never should have attacked health care because it was too complicated. Um, and, and Hillary Clinton knew it was complicated. And I think other people let him hang. That's what I think. And I think that's not right. I think you should have attacked energy or, or, or jobs or something else that was much closer of a pocketbook issue. And so I hope he, I hope he gets his nerve back because I think his instincts are terrific. So time for one more. Okay. And then Stuart's going to be up here signing books. Yes. You had mentioned taking other people's temperature at the beginning of negotiations. Yes. Are there any methods that you find particularly effective? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> How do you feel? You seem a little upset about something. Um, so what's new? That's why I tend to do it. Um, and d have you tried that and it doesn't work for you, so you're looking for something else? or? I'm probably not that intuitive, and I don't get much to go off after that. 
Right. Bring somebody with you who's more into it. <laughs> <laughs> do, not expect, do not expect you to be able to do everything. Use the team. You know, who is that woman, uh, uh, Lieutenant Troy on Star Trek, you know, the one that was touchy-feely with everybody? Bring one of those with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, okay. Thanks.